an interview of Mr. David E. Golden on 7 March 2001 at Latham headquarters. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert von Hasselm, videographers, Mr. Wayne Clark. Mr. Golden, where and when were you born? I was born in Albany, New York on December 24, 1923. Actually on 53 Elbon Place in Albany, at home. Uh -huh. And you grew up in Albany? Grew up until I was 16 years old. Well, then we moved to Latham, on Forts Ferry Road in Latham, where my dad bought a 25-acre farm. And I lived there until the time I went into service. Okay. And where did you go to school? I went to Albany Public Schools. I went to various school four, school 16, school 27, Philip Livingston Junior High School, Albany High School, and then I finished at Water Vliet High School in Water Vliet the last year. When you were growing up, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Well, I, at one time I wanted to be a minister. Uh, I, I wanted to be a, maybe a lawyer. I had an uncle that was a lawyer. My grandfather was a lawyer, my mother's father. And I thought I'd want to be either a lawyer or, or a minister. And uh, well, in those days, I had four brothers and four sisters. Mm -hmm. So there was nine children in our family and I was in the middle. I came after one boy and four girls. And the idea of going to college was kind of not, not, not very possible at that time, so there was very little chance of me ever being a lawyer. So uh, when I got out of uh, high school, I worked on the farm for a while. In fact, that's one reason why uh, I, uh, my dad wanted me home to help with the farm. We had uh, about 30 head of milk cows in and, and uh, grew, grew asparagus and different uh, vegetables. And so I helped my dad with the farm until I got a chance to go to work in Albany at the old central warehouse, the cold storage warehouse, mm -hmm. where I was making 87 cents an hour. And believe me, in 1942, 87 cents an hour was a lot of, I, I had been used to working for a dollar and a quarter a day on the farm. Mm -hmm. So I, I worked on the central warehouse. But of course the war was on by now, this was 1940. And, and Pearl, uh, I remember the night we went to the Grand Theater. I'm not sure whether it was a Saturday or a Sunday night. But we went to the old Grand Theater in Albany that was between North Pearl Street and Broadway, mm -hmm. right, you know, near where the Palace Theater is now. And when we came out of the theater that night, they were yelling, extra, extra, Pearl Harbor bomb. The Japs have bombed Pearl Harbor. I remember exactly, here I was an 18-year-old kid, and I said, boy, now we'll get those guys. And because we knew that the war was going on in Europe and possibly sooner or later we'd be in it, but I was only 18. And, and, uh, and still, my dad needed me on the farm, but they were drafting. They were drafting, brother, my brother-in-laws went, with, even one with two children. And so the time came when I uh, decided, hey, if they're going, I'm going. I went down and enlisted. Even though at the time they were only drafting at 20, mm -hmm. I still, I, I volunteered because I got my choice of service. I wanted a tank outfit. Why are you tank outfit? Well, probably because I thought I was a big deal uh, you know, farming, running a tractor on the farm. And some of the farmers out here then, where Burns Whitney Estates is now, was a farm. And the man, farms who ran that, they never had a tractor. Mm -hmm. And we used to go over and do their plowing for them. I did with my dad's tractor. And I enjoyed equipment and machinery, and I thought uh, driving a tank would be the greatest thing you could ever do. So that's why I asked for the Armored Force. Well, let's back up a bit before we go into the Armored Force and your experiences. Uh, what was life like after Pearl Harbor here in Latham? Uh, well, you could, uh, uh, everybody was looking for help on the farms. You, you could get a job on the farm in the winter, a dollar and a quarter a, a day, and that's from six to six, 12 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, in the summertime, oh, the, your, your pay went up to two dollars a day. Uh, we used to walk, believe it or not, we'd walk from Latham to Water Vliet to save the bus fare to go to a theater in Troy. That was nothing to walk down there and back. Um, or we'd ride the bus to Water Vliet and walk across the bridge because we saved seven cents that way by walking across. And, and uh, money, one rule in my family where I grew up, my family was that however much money you earn, half of it went to your parents. Mm -hmm. You make $12 a week, six went to your parents, and you kept six. Or if you made $9, regardless. And so uh, 
uh, I felt that I had a responsibility to my parents. My, my, I had the greatest parents anybody could ever want. And I felt responsibility to them. But I also come, came from a family that was very patriotic. My, my, my mother belonged to the DAR. She had ancestors in the Revolutionary War. And the only problem with that was when I looked back into my father's ancestry, he too had ancestors in the Revolutionary War. But one of them was a Hessian soldier mm -hmm. fighting for the British. And, and he settled after the war out in Rensselaer, that's Rensselaer, a town of Rensselaerville out in southwestern Albany County. Mm -hmm. And that's where my dad came from. So I, I just, I, I grew up with a lot of patriotic feelings in my family. Mm -hmm. And my dad had never been in the war because uh, he was, Actually, he was, he was already too old for World War I. And so he, and of course, when World War II came along, he was well into his 70s at that time. I don't know who he was. He was in his 60s. But uh, uh, so, I don't know, uh, Latham, we used to, at that time, Route, Route 7 at Ramp and Troy to Schenectady was a two-lane highway. And alongside it was the old like a, a dirt road, the old, where the old railroad tracks used to be, when the railroad, the, uh, you know, the Schenectady Railway used to run trolley cars from Troy to Schenectady. And the biggest thing we ever did at night was, after working for 12 hours, go up and walk up and down from Latham, back here to, maybe up to Verdoy and back and forth, and it was girls would come out and walk, and we were kind of, you know, uh, uh, getting acquainted. And uh, that's about what it was. There, there was a, an awful lot of excitement. Uh, was not unusual sometimes to ride a bicycle into Albany to visit kids who I had gone to school with in there in, you know, years before. Uh, the big thing was on the weekend we generally went to a movie at the old Grand Theater. And that's, uh, that's why I remember so well the night that they bombed Pearl Harbor when we came out and heard that. And from there on it was just, uh, I guess there wasn't much doubt that most, most young men were going to go into service. And, and so I just hustled it along a little by, by enlisting and going and getting my choice of service. Hey, you said your mother's, your mother's family had uh, ancestors who were in the Revolution? Oh, yeah. Or? yeah. If you go up to the, if, uh, uh, up in the Blue Mountain Lake Museum, the Blue Mountain Lake in New York State, I was told that there's a sign up there that says Mills Brothers General Store. And this was my mother's name, maiden name was Mills. Well, her grandfather would be, I think, my great-great-great-grandfather. Uh, they had started the first trading post north of, uh, north of uh, Keysville, or north of, well, up near Sackendog, anyway, in that neighborhood, someplace near Blue Mountain Lake. And th that was way back. And, and he was captured and, and held a prisoner in, the, in Quebec during the Revolutionary War. And back during the uh, one of my mother's greatest fears was that we might look back into our ancestry and find that uh, Benedict Arnold was, was related to us, and chances are he was. But so uh, it was, a, I grew up with that feeling in my family that, you know, uh, America's a great place, a great place to be, great place to be proud of, and, and a great country to serve. Any uh, Civil War ancestors? Uh, no, no, uh, not that I know of. No, no, no one in the Civil War. And then no one in World War II, or I mean World War I, World War I. Uh, so, uh, how did your family feel when you said you wanted to enlist? Well, it's strange because my dad was in the hospital at the time, had very serious illness, and I had to go down. He had actually signed for me to go, mm -hmm. and uh, he was kind of proud of the fact that I was going. Uh, my mother was too. I'm not sure that they were happy about it because after all, I was helping support the family at that time. And, uh, but uh, I, I had done it and they agreed. My dad signed the papers and I was ready to go. And, and I, I, I have no doubt that they were proud. I had three younger brothers than me who hadn't gone yet. Eventually they did, two of them did. But uh, I think my mom was, was proud that I went. So you joined the Armored Force? Armored Force, yeah. That was my choice. So tell me, well, where were you originally sent for training? I went, to, well, first I went to Fort Dix, New Jersey for induction. Mm -hmm. And from Fort Dix, they put us on a train. We didn't know where we were going. And where did we end up? At a place called Camp Campbell. It's on the Tennessee, Kentucky border between Hopkinsville, Kentucky, and Clarksville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, way out, and we were the first 
you wanted to go there. When we went there, there was red clay and no grass and uh, brand new barracks buildings, and it was uh, quite a, uh, an experience. First thing they do when you get there, they put you in a big field house and they start training you for eye perception and all kinds of physical abilities to decide what unit you were going to go in. Well, I wanted tanks. I didn't know that in an armored division you have artillery, you have tanks, you have infantry, armored infantry, you have ordnance, you have 14 different units in, a, in an armor. At that time they had armored regiments. And so I was assigned to Company I of the 44th Armored Regiment. Our motto was the eyes have it. And uh, I started my basic training with the Company I. Well, I was, uh, oh, that was in October, uh, Halloween night in October 42. And come around the middle of December, they called me into the orderly room. We had learned right, you know, all the close order drill and, and, and right face and left face and about face and we were learning map reading and all kinds of tank maintenance and things like that. But they asked me due to the fact that I had a high, I, a high IQ and a high uh, uh, mechanical aptitude mark, they asked me if I'd want to go to school. I never stopped to think. I said, gee, that's a chance. I said, yes, I do. So the result was they were going to send me to Fort Knox to go to tank maintenance school. Well, they said, you've got to be a PFC to go there. Now, nobody, none of the recruits had made even one stripe. And I was the youngest man in the company. And here I got a PFC stripe. But then before they went, they found out you can't go there if you're a PSC. You had to be at least a technician fifth grade. So here I was, not even three months in the Army, I made T5. Uh, and off I went for three months in tank maintenance school. And I did well there. And uh, when I came back, <laughs> I came back to my company, they had assigned all the, all the, all the assignments in the company had been made. In other words, they had selected their tank commanders and their gunners, and, and I ended up in the motor pool, which isn't what I wanted. I wanted to be a combat soldier. And let me make a long story. Eventually, I did. I got transferred into a tank as a tank gunner. And I ended up in the company commander's tank. And that's where I stayed for all the time through Europe for the next 30 months. Now, this was with the 44th Regiment? Or? No, no. After we, we trained until. September of 43 at Camp Campbell. It's now Fort Campbell, of course. And then we went on Tennessee maneuvers. Well, three months on Tennessee maneuvers into past Thanksgiving, and then they reorganized the armored divisions. They did away with the armored regiments. I understand now all except a couple of divisions. Third Armored they didn't do this with. But regardless, most armored divisions were triangularized and became tank battalions. The result was that they had an extra tank battalion, and the one extra that they had was the 714th. That was us. So when the 12th Armored Division had the maneuvers went to Camp Barkley, Texas, near Abilene, Texas, the 714th, our, our battalion, was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, as a what we call in those days a bastard tank battalion. And we spent about three months at Fort Jackson. And once we went out on maneuvers and we tore up so much farm country there that uh, they stopped us. They, they grounded us. They wouldn't even let us run our tanks down there. So all we did for the next couple of months was guard duty. I walked around warehouses. Every, we, instead of doing two on and four off, we used to do a four on and eight off because we were doing it constantly. I got so I knew how many nails were in the buildings and how many boards, you know. So but three, then all of a sudden, I guess they needed a, a tank battalion in the Pacific. And instead of tank, we thought we were going to Europe early. So they took the 44th tank battalion out of the 12th Armored Division at Camp Barkley and sent them to the Pacific and then moved us back to the 12th Armored Division with the 12th Armored. We once again were Hellcats back with the 12th Armored Division. And we trained in uh, uh, Camp Barkley for, well, that we went back there in, when what, must have been May or, let's see, January, January, February, March, April, so we went back and we stayed there most of the summer. And in 43, we, uh, we left Camp Barkley, went to Camp Shanks in New York down near West Point. And then we boarded the uh, USS Simon Abbott and sailed for Europe. Now, my history papers tell me that the 12th Armored Division landed in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. However, we didn't. The ship that I was on lived in, uh, landed in Southampton. 
I remember the day going across the ocean when I saw this land and the sailor said, that's Land's End. The land's End is the southwestern tip of British Isle, of the main island, anyway. And it was a thrill, you know, 18 years old, you know, you're doing something. Well, by this time I was 19. And, and uh, we landed in, in uh, Southampton. They took us up in the countryside. We were in some Quonset huts. And within 10 feet of the Quonset hut, the farmers were plowing the ground uh, because they were, you know, they had to utilize all the ground for food over there. And we spent two or three nights in, in these Quonset huts. And then they moved us to a place called Tidworth Barracks. Mm -hmm. Tidworth was between Andover and Salisbury in southern England, south of, southwest of London. And these were old, big old brick buildings. That was, that was, had to be in November because it was when, what, I think it went to Wilkie was running against Franklin Roosevelt for president, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's yeah. the year that Wilkie got beat. And uh, I remember the results coming out. We were still in Tidworth at that. Of course, by this time, you know, the Allies were already in, into, into uh, uh, France. And my biggest gripe, <laughs> I used to get some of the guys a little peed down me, although they all loved me, I know they did, but I used to get them peed a little because I said, boy, if we don't hurry, the war is going to be over before we get there, you know? And anyway, we, we got new tanks, and uh, with these, the tanks we got at that time, M4 Shermans, were, uh, were uh, with the old 75s on them, and uh, we, we got all set, and we did go down one time down on the, Eng on the English Channel and fought some fought target practice out into the channel. But sooner or later, pretty soon the day came, we were going to go to, go to France. And we went down and we boarded the LSTs. And uh, we you put your tanks down in the hole and chain them down and everything's all set. Now we're ready to go and they had all these number 10 cans, you know, vegetable cans all around the place. What are they afraid of? <laughs> Sailors, as you find out. Well, we weren't, we sat there a couple of days, I guess, because they, the weather was so bad they couldn't go out on the channel. But finally we did, we sailed for France. And we, we came in near Normandy, not far from Le Havre. And uh, of course, by this time, our troops were, you know, had taken Paris. And uh, we, lanced, we were billeted in the field in a big old barn near, near a place called Ofay, A-F-U, or anyway, Ofay, France. And the French kids had come out there in the barn and talked to us, and, and some, and it was really kind of rural country. I mean, it really seemed like back in the 1800s, right, where we were there. But we, we, we had our Thanksgiving dinner there in, that, in the field there. Then we went across to, uh, France, and we got over toward, uh, toward, uh, toward Strasbourg. And we had our first battle in a town called Bed Bedweiler. Bettweiler, and uh, I got the maps and things here to show that, but, but uh, that's where we had our first casualties. One, uh, uh, one of our uh, tanks, and this, this is kind of hard to believe, but I know what happened. The, the Germans dropped a mortar shell in front of it, another mortar shell on behind it, and believe it or not, the third mortar shell hit right smack in the turret. And a man, a Sergeant White, who had been a recruiting sergeant in Detroit and had fought like the devil to get into a combat outfit and had been assigned to our outfit. He was standing in a turret when that hit. And another man named uh, Black, Black, Blackham was, was the gunner. And anyway, it just, it bent, the, it bent the, the breach of the 75 and it just blew those men all apart. One man got out. Jones Woods was the assistant driver, and he got out with just a little nick on his back. He came running to tell us what happened. And that was our first casualties. And on that same day, we captured some prisoners in this little town, and some young German soldiers, I don't know whether they were AWOL or what, but we captured them, and they, he claimed he was trying to get back to his outfit, but we didn't know what was happening. But we, the, the worst, that was the worst that happened to us there. We did get some, uh, uh, one of the headquarters, headquarters company tank uh, lost a crew, tank crew too. They, were set, they started a fire where there had already been a campfire. And sure enough, don't the mortar, the Germans drop a shell right on that spot. They probably had it zeroed in. They probably had that mark and killed three or four of the tank crew of the, the battalion commander's tank. And so that was in Bettweiler. Then, well, we just, you, you, 
from there, our biggest, our biggest battle was a town called Hurlishheim. And, and uh, uh, that was during the, when the Battle of the Bulge started in the north, up in Luxembourg. And, and uh, we were at that time down, almost down to uh, uh, And now, now I'm losing track of my, my cities. But anyway, we were in a, a town called Hurlisham, right, right not far from the Rhine River. Uh, and and we, we were told to go down there that there was seven or 800 Germans down there and we should clean it out. Well, they sent uh, one combat command of an armored division that consisted of a tank battalion, and an armored infantry battalion, and armored field artillery, and some assorted units. And we went down toward, uh, toward uh, uh, I was with the company commander when he got his orders. And down we went, and we, the trouble down there was this town was right near the Rhine River, and it was canals all around it. And the Germans had blown the bridges. And the first thing we had to do was get the engineers down there to repair the bridges so we could get into this town, Hurlishheim. And every time we'd fix a bridge, they'd blow it again. And finally, we got across the first bridge, and we're between the Zorn River and, and another little stream that was there, and they blew the bridges on both sides of us. Here we are, a bunch of tanks sitting out. Our armored infantry got in and got into Hurlishheim, and they started getting, getting really massacred. It turned out there were, there were elements of seven or eight German divisions in there. This was a, a, a reflex from the Battle of the Bulge, which was farther north. They had sent some troops down north of Strasbourg, and it, that's where we were about eight or ten miles north of Strasbourg, this was. And, and uh, finally they got the bridge fixed, and we got into Hurlishheim. And uh, I was in the company commander's tank, and they called him, the battalion commander, we called him jo Joseph Phelan, his name was, we called him Smokey Joe. And he called a meeting, and all the officers went in this one building, and they weren't in there five minutes when a shell hit it. What it was, it was Germans around us in all the alleyways. And we're in a little town, you can't maneuver your tanks, and our armored infantry had been so, that some of them were down to 20, 30 men in the company. And, so anyway, the tank right behind me got hit, and four men got out of it. One man, the assistant driver, a man named Bob Blackham, who had come from us from the old ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program, as he came to us just before we went overseas. Very intelligent man, very, he, he, would, he was still in there, the assistant driver, and the tank was starting to burn. And I, uh, foolishly, I shouldn't have done it, but I left my tank and I went to that tank and I, I went in the driver's hatch because everybody else had gotten out. And I unlatched his hatch and I was able to boost him out and somebody pulled him out. We got Bob out, but he had been hitting us, what it was, a Panzerfaust. They only put a hole about this big in the side of the tank, but when it gets in there, it goes and must have hit him right in the side of the head. And Bob was a wonderful, wonderful man. Anyway. I took him in, in a building there and I held him for quite a while. It seemed like a long time. It couldn't have been too long because I had to get back to my own tank. And because the company commander was in this meeting. And then don't a shell hit the building where all the officers are meeting. Our battalion commanders, we call him Smokey Joe Phelan, his name was. He got a, a broken back. They cut, uh, we loaded him on the back of a tank and took him out. And a couple of our officers from our company got hit. The, the ranking officer left after that in town was, was, was my own Charles Clayton, my own company commander. So we started out. We, we got orders to evacuate the town because we couldn't maneuver. Tank, it was no place for tanks to start with, and we didn't have enough armored infantry. The Germans were right in the alleyways. When they hit this one uh, tank behind me with a Panzerfaust, the man wasn't more than 10 feet away when he, when he fired a Panzerfaust at it. And so we started out, we got hit. Our tank got hit. And in fact, as we got, we, we got hit and it rolled right over in, into a canal. And I jumped out and my, my assistant, uh, the Charlie Clayton, our company commander, wasn't, he was up front leading us out of there by foot. He was, I was only at that time, what, about 21 years old? Charlie Clayton was four days less than a year older than me and he was our captain. Wonderful soldier. But anyway, we lost our tank on the way out, and we, but we did get out. Finally, I rode out on the back of another tank, soaking wet, because I'd gone through the ice in this, in this stream, the canal that we went in, 
And we got out, and two days later we had another, well, I, well, I don't think it was 30 hours, we had another tank. They, they brought, got us another, 40 guys went back. I went with Ch uh, Clayton and another tank, and then the other th three men in our crew went back and got, they, they got another tank. So we were right back up there, with it, but the only good thing about this all was that our original tank had, had a 75 millimeter gun on it. The new one had a 76. That don't sound like much, one millimeter, but the muzzle velocity was about half again as much. With the 76, you had to almost learn to read your sights again because the trajectory was so much flatter. And uh, so uh, that was Hurlishan, or Hurlishan. And uh, it was our real, really our baptism to battle. We, we lost one of our tank battalions. They sent another, finally they decided to send to commit the whole division and when the 43rd tank battalion came in from the south to try to relieve us, they lost 90% of their tanks. They just, the Germans had 8-inch guns or 88s or whatever there, and they picked them off just like a shooting gallery. And uh, uh, the last they heard, the battalion commander from the, the 43rd said, uh, I'm hit, and that was it. And, and uh, we, we, they took a, later on they took a, an anti-aircraft battalion and made a tank battalion out of it to replace. After they'd taken two years to train us here in the States as a tank battalion, it, it, they did this in something like, uh, what, less than 100 hours. They, they made an anti-aircraft battalion into a tank battalion to replace the 43rd. And uh, so, but then we, we had a, we feel that we had a very outstanding combat record by the time the war ended. Hurley Shine was bad enough, but then we went down, we took Colmar down in the south, we met the first French down there, and we, we took the city of Colmar. And then we went up, we were assigned to the Third Army with Patton. We jumped off from, uh, I think it was Trier, or up near Metz, Metz. And we went down, our, we were supposed to take worm, or worms on the Rhine River, but uh, we had four armored divisions abreast that time. And we were diverted south, and we took the city of Spire. Spire was um, like a, almost uh, like a college town, a cathedral town, uh, some big schools there in a beautiful town. And we were, we got stopped by a roadblock going in there, and fortunately, because we finally did break through, and we weren't about four blocks from the bridge across the Rhine River when the Germans blew it. If we'd have been, oh, 15 minutes more, maybe we'd have been on it. But, so uh, we, we took Spire, and it was two days after that, or the next night, that we crossed the Rhine River. And off we went, and we started moving. We went through Germany, and we ended up down in Austria. And uh, almost to Nuremberg, but then we turned south and went, and took, uh, I feel that the 12th Armored Division, uh, well, I have papers that tell me that the Germans, the 12th Armored Division was the second most feared <laughs> American division the Germans had. Now, of course, that might be propaganda from, our, from people that are writing for our benefit, but, but regardless, I know that we, I feel that from the time, for the short time that we had in combat, because we didn't get in until, I, some of the men in my outfit, and some of them are still with us today, they'll tell you that, boy, that Golden, he was the biggest fright he had was that he wasn't going to get there before the war was over. Because, uh, you know, I, 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 I just felt that, hey, we're into this. We might as well see some of it. And, but we had a good outfit, 12th Army Division. We, we got a lot to be proud of. And, and Abilene Christian University in, in uh, Abilene, Texas, has started a museum it's dedicated to the history of the 12th Army Division. And uh, in fact, this in, in the first week in November, October of this year, we'll be down there when they when they officially open that museum. And we got people from our own outfit to go down there all the time and work work on it, help it get, get going. We're we're donating a lot of money to it, but and a lot of our uh, you know mementos, our our uh, souvenirs are down there, and and a history of every outfit. So. I'm, I'm particularly proud of have been, been a Hellcat, a member of the 12th Army Division. After the war was over, I was, I was actually hit three times by enemy fire. Never got a Purple Heart, because for the simple reason, I went to the aid station once, and that's when I got hit right on the head, and the blood was streaming down, and that was the day after I lost my tank in Hurlisham. That's the reason I got hit. I didn't have a tank. I was in a chow line, of all things, and I got hit with a shrapnel. And 
But when I went in the aid station, there was guys, men in there with their legs blown off. And I just didn't want to stay around, you know, so no paperwork was ever done. And I, I, I regret that today to a certain extent because a, a Purple Heart makes a, a lot of difference in some of the benefits you can get, like, mm -hmm. for instance, the VA hospital and things like that, you know. But, uh, hey, I'm, I'm proud that I served with the 12th Armored Division and, and, and the men I was with. We, we'll have our, we have a reunion every year. Every year we have a national reunion. This year, I, oh, I got the Hellcat. That's our, that's our monthly newspaper we print. Mm -hmm. And, and each, each unit has a, a unit representative. I write for the 714th Tank Battalion. That's my, my column there. That's Dick Iverson. Uh, he's the man that wrote to Disney and got Disney to draw up these different things for our Hellcat, Hellcat unit, like this. That's our whole Hellcat symbol. And, and, and uh, I get pictures in of different people each month. But we had some great, great people. And, and the thing that's held us together probably now for over 55 years is, is this newspaper we put out every month. Every month that comes out. We got one unit now that don't have a unit rep because we're starting to dwindle down. I'm down to 207 people on my roster right now, and I think 50 of them are widows. So we're, we're starting to fade away like, who was it, Doug uh, MacArthur said? But uh, we, had, we had a good outfit, the 12th Army Division, and, and I'm proud of, that I served in it. Tell me what happened to you after the war. Well, after the war, I, uh, when I hit Fort Dix for my discharge, that's, I made a couple of mistakes. First, they asked you, do you want to, you, <laughs> first they asked you, one of the things they asked you just before your discharge is, do you want to, you want to place, put in a claim for any, any wounds or anything? I said, no, I just want to go home. But they said, do you want to join the reserve? I said, yeah, I'll join the reserve. I like the Army. I, I enjoyed Army life. Even though it was during the war, but I met a lot of good people, and, and I enjoyed uh, uh, discipline. Don't bother me. I, I, I can uh, take it along with anybody else. And I, I think sometimes there's all too little discipline in this life to some people. That, but anyway, I, I got my discharge, and I, and, and, but I did join the reserve. One of my disappointments was that from 19, I got out February 1st, 1946. <coughs> And the reserve wasn't very active at that time. It was active reserve I was in. I got credit for three years in the active reserve, but I, in that whole three years, I don't think I went to, if I went to five meetings, down in Waterville it was, we went, because I lived right over here on Forge Ferry Road, and, and it was not much to it. The, the reserve was very, it was more like inactive than active reserve. But then when, when my time was up in the reserve, I'm not sure how long it was between then and I, and I was working in the General Electric Company in Schenectady and one of the men, men up there said, you know, I'm in the National Guard, why don't you come and join the National Guard? Well, I did. Now, I'm not sure how long it was between when my, t uh, February 1st, when my enlistment in the reserve expired and I joined the National Guard, I'd have to look. Um, but I don't have a discharge, that's my problem from the National Guard yet. And so I joined the National Guard as a private. I'd been a corporal now for t over three years, or a technician fifth grade, and then I made corporal from that. And that's all, all that time in the service, as high as I got, I saw men come in there that, bingo, they were, they were sergeants because they were tank commanders. They were, in, in our outfit, you were staff sergeant, was ta it was platoon sergeant, it was only staff. And uh, we had one tech sergeant, he was a motor sergeant. And we had a first sergeant. That was the, the uh, extent of our uh, NCOs. And so uh, I was a corporal. And not ashamed, I'm proud of it, in fact, of the fact. But anyway, I got out and I got in the National Guard and the Reserve. And I don't know what I was in the Reserve, I don't remember. But when I went in the National Guard, I went in as a private. And with, within about Two years, I was a master sergeant, and some people found fault with that. One of the arm, regular army officers, when I went up, I, I took the series 10 course and passed it, passed it well. But the trouble was, by this time, I was 27 years old, overaging grade for second lieutenant. But 
I got a stack of papers home like that, all kinds of endorsements from the commanding general, New York National Guard, and everything else, uh, you know, recommending me to, uh, that I be accepted. So I went before the board over in Troy, and I don't know, I think there was some politics going on right at that time, because we had a battalion commander in Schenectady, and it seems to me that they were trying to get him to retire. And so they said to me, you go back, and you wait a month or two, and then you come back again, and then we'll consider you. I went back, and I went in, and I said, I just soon take my discharge. Because if I can't pass a board after all this time in the service, uh, and here were young kids coming along, and second lieutenants, you know. Not that, not that I, I, I think you should be young to be a second lieutenant, especially in the infantry. Mm -hmm. So anyway, to make a long story sh short, I got, I got out of the National Guard. And I've, I've uh, not been too happy with that. It wasn't one of my best uh, decisions because I liked the Army. I liked Army life. I liked Army discipline. And, and I felt that I, I, I had capable. I wanted to go to Korea. I, I went down two or three times and tried to enlist, and they wouldn't take me because I was in the National Guard during the Korean War. Because I felt that in the infantry, knowing what I knew about tanks, I could take and I could be a match for a tank. Because I know how easy it would have been for, one time we stopped our tank, they blew a bridge in Germany. And the bridge blew right ahead of us, so we stopped. We started making our coffee, mm -hmm. Nescafe, right. pardon, right. okay. and. Anyway, we started making our Nescafe, and one of my, my uh, uh, Jim Bagley, who was a, my, actually, he, Jim Bagley was a staff sergeant, but he was my loader for my gun because he was our communication sergeant. And he was with our tank because the company commander's tank, see, and he wanted this communication sergeant with him. But Jim got down, he went over in the bushes to urinate, and oh, so I see him grab him for his pistol, and here's a, a German, young German boy there with a Panzerfaust. Uh, Panzerfaust it looks like almost like a sink, you know, plunger. Mm -hmm. It's got a big ball on the end with a long tube on it, and he wasn't more than 10 feet from our tank. Now, if he'd have got up there and fired that, he'd have put a hole through the tank. Now, the kid was scared to death. What it was, they had taken this kid out of his house and gave him, given him a German overcoat, put him in a foxhole, and told him to, well, if the tank comes along, hit it. Well, the kid was laying in there crying his head off. He was scared to death. So we took him out, took, his, took the overcoat away, asked him where he lived. He said, down the street, and we kicked him in the fanny and sent him home. And that, well, that's how close we came to, you know. But they had blown the bridge. When they blew the bridge, they, they, would, they had people there still putting the charges in the bridge when they blew it. They blew their own people up there. So things like that, uh, how close you can come to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Let's hold there for a minute. Okay. Uh, we have Tape two interview with Mr. David E. Golden, 7 March 2001. Uh, what happened after the war? You came home? What did you do with the rest well, of Well, I came home and, and uh, first I, I went back to work on the farm, right over here in Forts Ferry Road. We, uh, at the time, my dad had about 32 milk cows in the barn and, and my dad wasn't well. And so I ran the farm for one year. I'll never forget, on the four, I got out of the Army on the 1st of February 1946. And we had asparagus, about eight acres of asparagus. So come uh, April, around in April, as soon as you can till the soil and the war weather gets warm, the asparagus starts coming along. And every morning, one of my younger, my younger brother and a neighbor boy, uh, I hired them and we'd go out and we'd cut asparagus every morning. And then I'd run it into market in Troy and I had a, a man that bought everything I could take him. So I made some money on asparagus. And on the 4th of July, I, uh, because I'd been in the service with men from North and South Dakota and from the big farms, you know, well, they didn't talk about acres in the, in the West like that, they talk about sections. One man, uh, Jerry Theobald, told me, I'm going to have a section of, of rye and a section of flax and a section of wheat, maybe. And he says, if one fails, I'll make my living on the other. I'll make it. He said, they don't necessarily own all that land. They lease it from the government, some of it. But anyway, so when I came home, I, I was going to do things. That, we used to start haying in, in late June, and we'd be haying until about the 1st of September, you know, going out, cutting hay, raking it, and bring it in. But what I did that year, I, uh, three or four of my neighbors got together. Georgie Volk, who runs a farm over here, was yet on 
Route uh, 7. He helped me out and another farm from the green farm up the road, but some of the other farmers came and I was, we only had 25 acres, but I was renting about 80 acres from, uh, from other farmers or, or other people around. So we went out and we mowed all that hay and we brought in 1,200 bales of hay on the 4th of July, 1946. And I don't think anybody had ever done anything quite like that around this neighborhood. I paid 10 cents a bale to have it baled. And that was $104 or something like that. And that was a lot of money in those days. And so, but anyway, we, we, we did it. We, we did all the hay in one day. And then, of course, things weren't going just right. It wasn't my farm. It was my dad's farm. And I had an older brother. And one of the things didn't work out. So, because, uh, well, anyway, to make a long story short, I just farmed it one year. And then I went to work in, a, in an automobile apprenticeship. And then, I, then uh, I got a better chance. I went to work for General Electric Company in Schenectady, up in the old turbine factory up there. And I worked there about 12 years. In the meantime, I was in the reserve. I was in the National Guard. I'd go away to camp two weeks every summer, and I loved it. I enjoyed it. I really uh, liked, I liked the military. And uh, uh, I always feel that a little bit of discipline don't hurt anybody. In fact, it's, I think it's one of the greatest things you can have. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, uh, then I met a girl and I got married. I got married in 1948. I better not forget that. I, my wife ever saw this. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, I got married in 1948 right over here on, on Wade Road. We lived at that time. and. Uh, uh, had a, went off on our honeymoon up to, up to Vermont, way back in the mountains, my wife and I, and, and to a brother-in-law's place, a farm way back in the hills. And the man that lived there around that farm had been gassed in World War I. And that's the reason he lived back there in the mountains, because of the air. He came down here, he couldn't breathe. So, uh, and I stayed at GE for, what, 12, 13 years. And things got, they had layoffs up there. So I left GE and I went to work for the Water Vida Arsenal. And I stayed with the Arsenal for 29 years and six months, something like that. Well, that's counting my military time, government time. I retired from the Waterfield Arsenal as I was their equipment manager, which was uh, a member of the commander's staff and so on. And I, I feel that the Arsenal was good to me. And uh, I, my wife couldn't have children, so we, we've adopted three children since then. And I have a son, Todd, my youngest son, who went in, in, uh, when he came home from one day from high school and he said, Dad, he says, I'm going to join the Army. I said, why are you going to join the Army, Todd? Of course, he had had the recruiting sergeants to the house, and I knew this was uh, in the wind. And he said, well, he says, I can get $24,000 to go to college. And uh, so, anyway, Todd joined the Army while he was still in school, and then he had to wait till he got out. And he was only home about two weeks, and off he went down to Fort Dix again. And he went to Fort Belvoir for engineering training for a short time. Then he went to uh, uh, Fort Benning for jump training. He did his jumps. One day he called, he said, Dad, I haven't jumped yet. And I said, well, he said, well, the weather's too bad. They won't let us jump. The next day he called, he said, Dad, I did it. He said, you jumped? He says, five times. One day, five times. They made their whole five jumps one day. I never jumped. I tried to volunteer from, from the 12th while we were still on the stage before. I tried to transfer it to the paratroopers and my company commander reamed me out. So he said, all the training we gave you, you're not going to the paratroopers. So I said, but, but Todd did it. And uh, then he went, he served his time. He met a girl in North Carolina, got married, never came home. But then he got out of the service after his four years, but then he got called back during the Persian Gulf. Todd went over in the Persian Gulf, and he was in charge of a, uh, a maintenance crew for a field hospital, all the le electronics, uh, uh, air conditioning, refrigeration. And, uh, and I, he's got a tape of what that, of that field hospital, I've seen it, and it was quite a, he said the one reason he kind of hated to see them close down that hospital when the, the Persian Gulf War was over was because they had Iraqi civilians in there that they were taking care of. He said they needed that hospital. They really needed the hospital. And so, but, uh, but Todd, uh, uh, Army life had changed. Now, I'm still very, very close to the men I was with. I got a call just today from a man in Kentucky 
because he wanted to be sure that he was going to be able to get in the same hotel next October in Abilene, Texas with me, with my unit. Although he wasn't in my unit, he was with the MPs of the 12th Armored Division. But he worked with our company a lot. And he said, Dave, I want to be with your unit out there. And so I told him how to go about getting, because I've made a range. We're going to have five hotels in Abilene in October because they're small. And, I, and I've already written to all my people a letter so that they know what hotel to go to. And the fact is we've got 24 reservations made. The last I knew last week. I imagine we've got more now. So uh, it's, uh, I've been stayed with it, with the 12th Armored. I was president of the association in 1980-81. I've been, a, I was a unit rep for several years before that. And now I've been unit rep again now for the last 10 or 15 years. I write a co monthly column. 2,000 words or so, and uh, generally I had to cut myself short because I can't get everything I want to put in, but, but uh, you can see our newspaper there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a, that's what's held us together, but we just, we, they talk about, you know, the book, the, who was it wrote the book, The Greatest Generation? Mm -hmm. uh, I've read it, I, and, and, you know, I could, I could name 100 people from the 12th Armored Division or the 714th Tank Battalion who could who could write their autobiography and be in there and, and just the greatest people ever. And I, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, respect for the people who served in World War II and since then. But I do realize that I think that the military has changed a lot since then. It's changed quite a bit. I'm not sure that I would feel right at home in it now because uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm afraid that they've relaxed. Well, when I went to visit my son at Fort Dix, when he was just had been inducted, they, he, he didn't even eat in the mess hall. He went to a cafeteria to eat, you know. And they, they didn't have the, the cohesiveness that, that I think that we had in our day. When you were a member of I Company, the 44th Armored Regiment, or C 714th, which was the same company, boy, you got. The worst of it was I went away to school, like I told you, in December of 42, I went to school. And when I came back, half of the men that had been there in basic training with me were gone. They had needed recruit, uh, replacements over in North Africa. And they had taken anybody below, below the rank of corporal. They had taken out and sent over there. So that's the reason a lot of people got promoted to corporal or sergeant quickly, early, and, you know, before well, within three or f five months of the time they were in the service because they, they wanted to protect the men, you know, that they wanted to keep in that company. So a lot of the men that I knew in the first early days of, of my training, before I went away to school, were gone. And I can name some of them yet because I got pretty close with them. But uh, so anyway, we went through Tennessee maneuvers. Mm -hmm. We went. We went to Camp Barkley. Uh, we went to Jackson for three months, and then we went to Barkley, and we, we shipped and uh, went to Tidworth Barracks. And, and these things are just as fresh in my memory today as, as it's been a very very big part of my life. And I don't know what my I often wonder what my life would have been like if I hadn't served in World War II. I don't want another war. I don't want to see my grandsons have to go to war, but. If the time ever comes, I hope they're fortunate enough to serve with the kind of people I served with. Good, good people. And they're just as great today as they were then. Uh, we had a couple of, uh, I can remember a few. One in particular, we had one man in our tank as uh, my uh, assistant gun, my loader, my loader. And he refused uh, in Hurlisham, where we were really getting beat up bad. Well, we lost our tank on the way out, I told you about well, we That man wouldn't load the gun. He just got, and this man was a staff sergeant, had been, a, had been a, uh, one of the cadre men in our outfit, one of the toughest guys ever in basic training. Mm -hmm. But when he got there, he just lost it all. He lost everything. He, just, he was so scared and frightened that he, he couldn't load the gun. That's the reason they changed and they put Jim Bagley, his assistant, in, in there after, after we got out of there. And, but 99% but of the men in our outfit were just 100%. Uh, uh, we, we had a couple of cases where men were, you know, didn't live up to what they were expected of them. But uh, for, for the bigger share of them, they were good, good people. What did you do with the guys who couldn't cut it? Uh, they just left him back. See, he, in other words, see what, he, he was our, our uh, communication sergeant. And Jim Bagley was his assistant. Well, what they did, they put Jim in here and left him back with the, with the trains. 
And, and, and of course, sometimes, one time we're coming down, going down toward uh, uh, Nuremberg. And we, we, you know, one day, uh, one day we went 50 miles, you know, down, down the Autobahn. And, and, and our trains, you know, the gas, pro, you know, our, uh, would be behind us and no telling how far back. Well, we went through a roadblock. We blew a roadblock up one time in the big woods. And we got through and off we go. And then we, we, about an hour later, we get a call. Our, when our trains got up there, the Germans had come back and set that thing back up again. And a man named Gray, George Gray, he was our armorer. He was in charge of all the you know, armament in the company. And he was one of these guys that every time we lost a tank commander, he was a sergeant. Every time we lost a tank commander, he'd be like, Clayton, Captain Clayton, can I come up? Can I take his place? Can I take his place till you get somebody? And he would. He'd come up and he'd take the tank commander's place until we got some. Here he was back with the trains and they got ambushed by this roadblock. And uh, George, they tell me George jumped up on a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on a, you know, on a six by six and sniper got him right in the head. And, and kill them, and and so you never know where where you know uh, uh, just sometimes it seems like the best people were the ones that really got hit, like the man that I pulled out of the tank or pushed out of the tank in Hurlishine, Bob Black, <coughs> well, I have a Blackham and a Blackard, so it sounds the same, but uh, this this was Blackham, and he had been a vice president for the Standard Oil Company of Ohio, and here he was a PFC. A P, because he had been with the ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program in Texas A&M, and when they disabolished that program, they sent a lot of them into the 12th Army Division as replacements. And Bob uh, was killed out there, and, and just a wonderful, wonderful guy, and, and it just seemed like you wonder, maybe God wanted them with him, you know. But uh, they were uh, just, it seems like the, another one, Noble, Noble Johnson was one of my mechanics. This guy could fix anything. You got a trouble with any, any motor problem, any kind of a problem with anything, he'd fix it. Sure enough, don't he? He's fixing a, a flat tire in one of the big trucks and a mortar shell it right next to him and killed him. And uh, it, was, it was men like that that we, we lost. And uh, all too many, and then, but the infantry. Our infantry got shot up so bad. It was, there was days when uh, an infantry company would be down to 25% strength, in the, into Hurlishheim especially, in Hurlishheim. But at one time, we used to go down the road. When we were going down the highways in, in Germany, there'd be, uh, we'd have a, a couple of tanks on point, and then there'd be maybe a couple of half-tracks of infantry. And then the tank I was in, the company commander's tank, and I'll never forget, we were going down one time and a mortar shell lit right in one of those half tracks with the infantrymen in there. Some of them got out. Some of them did get out, but a lot of them didn't. And, and things like that. And uh, it's just, uh, war, war can be hell. It is hell. Mm -hmm. But then again, I, I often wonder what my life would have been like if I hadn't been there. I wouldn't know some of these people. And something else would have happened, I suppose. But, but that's the way fate had it. I just thank God for the fact that I knew, knew some of these wonderful people I served with. Charlie Clayton, my company commander, he was, uh, he came to us after maneuvers when, well actually yeah, he wasn't with us in, in South Carolina when we were a separate tank at time. We had a, uh, uh, our Cla uh, Captain Cleary, Captain Cleary. He had been a, a, first, a first sergeant in the old army. And they practically, they claim he, they had to twist his arm to take a commission. But he ended up a captain. He was our company commander. And while well, we were well, we were a separate time. Then we went back to Barclay, to the 12th Armored. They took him out and put him in re recon, a 92nd recon. And they put Charlie Clayton in charge of our Charlie Clayton, we call him Junior. He, he was four days less than a year older than me. He was a captain. He had been ROTC at Texas, uh, Oklahoma A&M. And... And they, they say that he was a nephew to General Brewer, who was our division commander at that time. A lot of talk, but boy, I'll tell you, what a soldier. This man, he, he, he never got upset. Colonel Field would be back there yelling, Clayton, Clayton, take that bridge, take that bridge. And, and Charlie Clayton would say, we're doing it, we're doing it. But there was times when instead of 
sacrificing a couple of times to get through a roadblock, he'd encircle it, you know, and it took a little longer sometimes, but by gosh, he was right there, and in fact, he, he's the one that brought us out of Hurlishheim, and he got a silver star for that, and uh, uh, just, just some wonderful people. Wonderful people I served with, and, and I go to reunions now. I'll be going down to what we call a smoke. See, we have a whole bunch of reunions. We have a national reunion every year, and this year uh, we're going to have the uh, in October will be our national. But in the meantime, we're going to have uh, a, an Eastern reunion in in Pennsylvania. Uh, Smoky Mountain Reunion in, in Virginia, uh, uh, Midwestern, oh, seven, eight different ones around the country. There they are, all the different times we get together. And that shows you, here we are, 55 years later, and we're still got that esprit de corps that we get together. I think it's a, it's a good uh, example of the kind of people I served with in World War II. North Central, Northeastern, that's down in uh, Calicoon, New York, if you know where that is. It's right on the, right on the old uh, Roma Resort, Villa Roma Resort, we go down there. And that'll be in June. And uh, as long as I can afford them, I'm going to them. <laughs> you know, and, uh, but the national I have to make every year because I'm, I have to set a lot of the stuff up and, and do that. But, but uh, it's just, uh, We've been, we've been hanging together all these years. Like I said, I got a call this morning from one man, from the MPs. He wants to be with our unit. He, I want to be with the 714, even though he was with division headquarters. And, uh, uh, well, I don't know what more to tell you. It's just that, just that, I, I certainly hope we never have to fight another war, that my grandchildren or their children never had to fight another war. But I would say this, that I hope that if they ever do, that they can serve with men, people like I did. Not only were the men great, but since the war I found out how great the women are that they, they married too, because a lot of those women still come to our reunions even though their husbands are gone. And, uh, and they, in fact, I got a call what was it, third year Friday last week, from a girl in Florida. She said, I'm coming, and Wanda Challen's coming with me. Now, Wanda Challen, her husband was in the 56 Armored Infantry, one of our other outfits. But she comes with this because they share a hotel room together. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just, uh, the esprit de corps in our organization is just great. And I think it's... Let me ask you some questions, and then we'll get into that National Guard mm -hmm. period. Okay. Um, what was the first type of tank you were trained on? First tank, M M3, that was the old Grant, U.S. Grant, with a 75 on the Sponson and a 37 in the turret. And uh, with the right whirlwind engine. And, and uh, uh, i never forget one time we were cleaning, the, they used to put crews of people in there cleaning them up. Well, we only had two or three tanks when we first went in the service. And, there, and, there, and there's a place, if you pull this thing, it's a fire extinguisher. And somebody that was cleaning must have pulled it because of fire. If you want to see five or six guys try to get out of a tank in a hurry, I'll never forget that. A lot of them. But that was a grant. And then we went toward uh, the end before we were still at camp. But before we went on maneuvers, we started getting the M4s. And we got all different ones. We got ones with uh, uh, some had the right whirlwind engines in. Some had, uh, these were medium tanks. Some had the uh, uh, Cadillac engines. Five six cylinder Cadillac engines and they were synchronized but the trouble with them was they'd get out of synchronization we'd go out with one running pretty good and by the time we come back in from the field uh, two of the engines would be dead and we'd be dragging them with just barely limping in but when we went to the Ford V8 and the Ford V8 engine was had originally been a 12 cylinder engine for aircraft they cut it down to eight cylinders for a tank the result was that the timing on those was not the same, you know. In other words, they didn't change the timing. So, in other words, instead of taking eight into 360 for your timing, it was eight into or 12 into 360. So, time. But anyway, that's just a technicality. But the Ford engine, we never had any engine trouble all the time. We were in combat with our Fords, and uh, uh, the worst of it was once in a while they had to make a stop during our run through Germany for first echelon maintenance, 
And then the next day we'd get shellacked, you know, because if you gave the Germans a chance to set up, they, one day they were waiting for it. We lost one of our lieutenants that way. And of all things, his tank got hit with white phosphorus. And we understood the Germans didn't have white phosphorus. They got some someplace, and a man named La France, Richard La France, and he lost his eyesight. And when I came home, I visited him. He was a masseur for out in Cornell University for their football team. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dick was there, and uh, couldn't see, of course. But, so, uh, uh, and. Uh, well, tell me about the, uh, the, you spent some time in the M3 Grant. And, uh, M3 Grant. Oh yeah, yeah. That was, your first tank? that was early. Yeah, we didn't. I didn't see. That was see. That's the, the thing. When I was there, only less than three months. When they sent me away to school, mm -hmm. and when we went to school, of course, the training that was at Fort Knox, Armored Force School, and I was training all on the M4s. We didn't. We, by the time I went back, they were starting to get the M4s. And, and the rest so, of the war, you served in M4s. Oh yeah, that's all we ever had in combat. And 483s, uh, in fact, with the Ford V8 engine. Yeah. yeah. How, how did the uh, M4 compare to the M3? M4 to the M3? Yeah. Oh, no comparison. The M4, you had a, you had a uh, well, first off, a 75 millimeter gun in a turret, 360 degrees rot rotation. Right. And you could, you could, that's one of the reasons why we were able to beat the Germans, because we could turn our tanker, our, our main gun, two or three times while they turned once. And, and, and we could outmaneuver them. In other words, if they'd got that 88 on us, all they needed was one shot with an 88. Going into Nuremberg, I saw two tanks in a row where an 88 hit the front tank on the heaviest armor plate right in the front, went in the front, out the back of the first tank, and in the front and out the back of the second tank. Two tanks in a row with an 88. Now, R-75, I hit a German tank nine times. We never considered a tank knocked out until it started burning. I hit one nine times at about 1,800 yards, and it's, then it started smoking. The first, about the third or fourth shot, something flew off it. I think it was probably knocked the hatch off it. Something flew off it, but uh, we didn't start. We hit it nine times before we considered it knocked out. So, uh, but the, the, the Ford V8 was, I mean, the, the four, M4 was twice the tank that the M3 was. Because with the M3, if you got a tank knocked off, now my, got my driver, Julian Head, was my driver. He had been with Patton in North Africa with the British 8th Army. He had gone from Pine Camp, the old, when Patton was at Pine Camp, I don't know what it was, the 1st or 4th Armored Division, one of the uh, armored divisions that was up at, and Julian had gone to France with Patton, uh, just a small crew as observers, and but they actually got in the tanks and went out on the on the desert, and uh, over there if they knocked the track off, you you were your 75 was was worthless practically because they could <coughs> outmaneuver you know you couldn't you didn't have 360 degrees road, uh, traverse. Now when we went the big thing though was when we went from the 75 we lost after we lost our first tank we got a new one. One of the best things that ever happened to us, we got one with a 76 on it. The difference was the 75 with armored piercing ammunition was muzzle velocity was 1,900 feet per second. With the 76 was 2,900 feet per second. You actually had to aim lower because you had a flatter trajectory, but it was twice the gun. It was, you know, when you hit it, you could, you could pierce more armor. But of course, the Germans' 88 was 3,900 feet per second. So uh, there again, you just didn't want to get with one of them or you were done. So how was it M4s up against German Tanzers? We never had any problem uh, because nine times, well, nine times out of ten we outmaneuvered them. We, the fact is we had a couple of, couple of our, uh, and our 92nd recon, a couple of, uh, an officer and a sergeant captured a German tank only because they couldn't get their damn turret to turn. And they actually, all they, the biggest thing they had with them was 45s. They captured How'd the they captured the tank. Well, they, the, the, the Germans surrendered, that's all. The, the gun was there and, and it surrendered. Of course, this was after we had crossed the Rhine, and I guess maybe they knew the war was over anyway, you know, maybe under certain circumstances. But, but uh, uh, if, if a German tank got a shot at us, that was it. You were, you were, you, the, there was no question if an 88 hit, hit our shirt. If you, you want to read a book, there's a book out called Death Traps, written by a man named uh, Butler, I think. Uh, anyway, he was an ordnance, ordnance officer with the 3rd Armored Division. And in the 3rd Armored Division, they, they never triangulized like ours. They stayed with the armored regiments. 
They, uh, I think their total co uh, component of the tanks was 280 tanks in the division. They lost, from Normandy till the end of the war, in the 3rd Army Division, they lost some, almost 800 tanks. Lost. And that means completely lost. Any tank that they, they when the ordnance battalion, ordnance man, uh, reported back at night and said, well, we had nine ta or seven or eight tanks hit, three of them are recoverable. They didn't count the ones that are recoverable, but the ones that they couldn't recover. They lost over 300% of their tanks during the time. They so were the trick was to, to get around the Germans. Oh, yeah, the tr trick was to outmaneuver them so that they couldn't get a shot at you, because if they got a shot at you, well, you saw what that picture I showed you, what it did to, uh, I showed you that picture, didn't I? What about the infantry was important to you to help? Uh, you to, in this respect, the infantry was important. Uh, when we went into Spire, uh, we went from Metz. When we, we, they transferred us from the 7th Army, Patch's Army, up to Patton's Army, the 3rd, up near Metz. And the idea was he was going to send four armor divisions headed for the Rhine River. So we went off. Our, our original objective was Worms. And someplace along the way it got changed and they diverted us south towards Spire. Spire is a cathedral town, beautiful city, beautiful city. And we got right there to the edge of town, uh, 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 and, and there was a corner. We, we were generally, being a company commander's tank, we were generally third or fourth tank in line. Maybe we'd have one section ahead of us. And one tank started to go around that corner in an 88 fire right down that block. Didn't hit him. He backed up and got out. And normally what you do then, you turn to your armored infantry and you say, get the roadblock, and they'd, they'd send a platoon up there maybe, maybe a couple of squads, anyway, they'd send enough people to encircle this thing and pick them off. Well, I'm, I'm not going to tell you the whole story because it gets a little political right here. But, but anyway, the, we had a company with us that wouldn't do it. It was the first time this particular company was ever with us as, in our task force. So Clayton, my company commander, he calls back. And they said, all right, we'll send Charlie Company up, Charlie of the 56th Armored Infantry. And the captain's name was Captain Fairborn. They were generally with our task force. But this particular day, they had another group with us that, well, never should have happened. So anyway, C Company came up. They went down there. 20 minutes, they had this roadblock cleaned out. Then we sailed on into town. We got down. We went three blocks from the bridge on the Rhine River. And Field, Colonel Fields back there yelling, Clayton, get that bridge, get that bridge. Bingo, we're about three blocks from it when it went up in the air. And Clayton said, Field, there's your bridge. Well, I often say, if it hadn't been for that hold up at that roadblock, we might have been on that bridge when it went. You know? But we did cross the river the next day anyway. But we got into town, and, and, and we parked in a village a square there. And when you went into the town, if the white flags started coming out, you felt pretty safe. But if you didn't see any white flags, you figure maybe there's SS here. Because if there was SS, the, the, even the civilians wouldn't put white flags out of them. Might take care of them themselves. So anyway, the white flags started coming up because the window opened and the infantry all got their guns up. But the infantry was important for that. Uh, and there, there was times when, well, for instance, in Hurlisheim, we got, we got, the tank behind me got hit because we didn't, the infantry was almost annihilated. It, uh, we didn't have infantry to protect the tanks. The tank in, in, in a small town is all, uh, that's what I said during the Korean War. If I'd have been a, uh, known what I know, if they, we were fighting the European War again and they wanted to give me uh, some of the signals to the Panzerfaust or a good bazooka, I, 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 I think I'm a match for a tank. Because, it, and, and, and anyway, in, in, in urban you know, warfare, because if you can just hide in an alley, our infantry was go coming in and there in Hurlisheim and the Germans were marching right in line with them. It was so in. Everything's so mixed up. But the infantry was, we, uh, tanks are great, but you got to have infantry support. How did you talk to the infantry? When you were By radio, or sometimes the, the, sometimes the, the, the commanding officer, uh, platoon leader, or the company commander would ride on, ride on our tank with our company commander. Mm -hmm. But we had, that's what we got. I got a book here called The Initial Attack on Hurlish in it. And it tells us that's one of the big things that happened when our infantry got across the Zorn River and went into Hurlishheim. And we couldn't get our tanks across it. We were over there firing in, but then we had to stop firing because we lost communication. We lost all communication with them. We didn't know where they were or where the Germans were. So we didn't dare give them supporting fire when we didn't know where they were. And even after we all got out of there, we, finally we did get in, the tanks did, but then we had to pull out because they were picking us off out of these alleys. 
And some of our guys were trapped in here, and they were up in the haylofts in these barns, and the Germans were down there. They used to wait till the Germans went to bed at night and go down and get food. Some some of the guys. And uh, uh, it, uh, well, there's a story, a book that. 56 Armored Infantry in a 714 tank battalion put a book out, The Initial Attack on Hurlishheim, and it tells all this. And uh, in fact, is I even got it right up in there. And uh, uh, it's uh, the infantry I got. Uh, when I came out and went in the infantry in the 27th Division, I'll tell you, I, I wanted to go. I, I, in a way, and my wife wasn't happy about it, but I wanted to go to, go to Korea because I thought, I could lead a, a squad or a platoon of infantrymen, and I could ha I could face enemy tanks, knowing what I knew. You know, camouflage is a big part of it. Secrecy is a big part of it. But perseverance and patience is, is a big share of a, an infantryman facing a tank. Because having been a gunner, knowing that all I can see is what I see out through that periscope, the gunner himself is, well, partially blind. And uh, the tank commander, if you've got snipers out there, the tank commander can't keep his out, head out too long either, especially in those. Now, the newer tanks, I think they've got better, better ways of observation uh, the, today, the, the Pershings and so on. But the tanks that we had, uh, it was, if they made you button up completely, if you didn't have infantry, you know, protection, you were, you were pretty, pretty uh, at risk, pretty much. Well, let's jump ahead and talk about your experiences in the uh, 105th Infantry. Well, I joined, I joined the National Guard. I went in there as a private. Uh, they asked, anybody want to come down this Saturday? I said, yeah, I'll come down. And so I forget, what was the man's name? Jones, I think. Jones was a, a motor officer for Headquarters Company, 2nd Battalion, 100, er, 105th Infantry. And uh, he, he said, what do you know about motor vehicles? I said, well, I, I said, I've, I've worked in gas stations. I went to Armored Force School. And so anyway, I went down and I, I worked on some of the vehicles, you know, changing the, or lubricating the wheel bearings. So that, that got me started. And then uh, one thing led to another. And the first thing you know, I was, where did I go now? I, well, was within a year, I was uh, operations sergeant. And it was in battalion headquarters and uh, in charge of plans and training. I worked with a man, maybe you know the name, Chauncey Cole. Did you ever hear of Chauncey Cole? Of course, this is quite a while ago, but he was operations officer for the 2nd Battalion. A man named Frigoletto was a battalion commander. And uh, uh, what was Williams? Williams was my company commander at headquarters company. But anyway, uh, where, where my company met on Wednesday nights, uh, once I became operations sergeant, I met the same night that the battalion staff met, which was Thursday nights. And we went down there, we were in charge, uh, making sure of all the training aids, and, uh, not, and I used to teach map reading, and uh, I, you had to draw your own, you know, lessons plans and, and do everything. And I was supposed to keep track of all the lessons plans for all the NCOs that, that were teaching in the battalion, and I, I really enjoyed that. I, I felt, but then I got, maybe they talked me into going for a, commission, you know, second, second lieutenant. I took the series 10 and passed it, and I started the series 20. And uh, I went over one night to the Troy, and, and uh, I think the colonel, then was Colonel Baker, I think. Baker? And it was an O'Toole. The training officer was O'Toole. And it, of course, then we had a regular army, you know, uh, major training officer. And I went in there, and I thought I looked pretty good. And they asked me a lot of questions, and I had my ribbons on, and I did have one ribbon wrong. I guess I, I did serve in the Army occupation, and it's not on my discharge, but I've got it now. I've got it in writing now, all the medals and things I'm entitled to. And I, I was wearing an occupation ribbon, it was the wrong one. It was uh, <laughs> World War I instead of World War II, I guess. And. The, the regular army officer recognized that. So he said, now he said, we're going to send you back. And he says, you come back in a month or two. Right now, we'll just say that you came in here with, with improper uniform. But he says, you come back in a month or so, and we'll see what happens. Well, as I fi find out, I think they were trying to, trying to displace our battalion commander back there. Because they were waiting back at the officers' meeting for me to come back, see. And of course, I didn't go back that night. And uh, uh, 
But I was a little peeved because I had had my uniform and my wife at that time worked for Wilkie's Laundry. I'd had that uniform in the press and as a master sergeant I certainly wasn't going to go over there looking sloppy. And, but anyway, I was pretty peeved about it and my, my enlistment time was up. And, and so, but then they changed our battalion, they did change our battalion commander. They pulled him out and, and put a new battalion commander, McCord I think it was, something like that, I'm not sure what his name was. And he brought his own operation sergeant with him. So they moved me to H Company, Heavy Weapons Company. Uh, you, you know, uh, well, anyway, uh, uh, Chase, Captain Chase was, was, later became a colonel. Yeah, I guess he was. Anyway, I, I, I took over as a platoon sergeant in Heavy Weapons Company, which was great. I enjoy. I liked that too. But, uh, but uh, then my enlistment ran out, and so I didn't, I didn't re-up. Uh, right, let's, let's hold there for a second. Okay, I've regretted it many times, but... Boy. So, tell me, how did you get to be a Master Sergeant uh, in operations in the less than a year? Well, I don't know. That's exactly what they said at the, at the, at the regimental board, you know. Uh, they, uh, the regular Army officers thought that that was rather quick, but I... I can go back to my regular army time. I was less than three months, I was a T5, not a corporal, but a T5. And I ended up, I, then when they moved me from motor section to the tank crew, I became a corporal. I'm not sure just when that was. But during combat, I was even recommended for a battlefield commission. While I was, we, but my company commander put the kibosh on that for the simple reason he said he's not leaving my tank. Now this sounds like a lot of hogwash, I know, but regardless, if, if any of my tank crew was here, they know about it. Well, in 1950, when you first, 50, 51, when you came in, yeah, to, yeah. The, the 105, uh, were the majority of guys combat veterans? Or they were no, 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 most of them were. There were very few, very few. Uh, a man named Jimmy Kloss was, uh, was an army veteran, but I don't know if he was combat, I don't. So the majority of people in the unit, where did they come from? Just, uh, well, I think, I, I don't want, I hate to say it, maybe some of them were in there because they didn't want to go in the army and go to Korea. You know, that was during the Korean War. And if, if you were in the National Guard, you didn't go to Korea. But, now, I don't say, say yeah. this derogatory about anybody, but some people felt that they had, to, they had to pay their military obligation one way or another, and a good way to do it was to join the National Guard. Was there talk about whether or not they would go to Korea? Oh, the there possibility was there. I used to listen to the news every night, hoping they'd call the 27th Division up. And, and it never happened. I mean, what do you guys it. think? Because the whole division had been called up for World War II. Did you, some of them think it would be likely to be called up for Korea? Uh, I, I, I always seemed like there was a, a, a good possibility of it, yes. I could never understand why, uh, why they didn't. Uh, why they, uh, maybe, maybe because they did so much in World War II, you know? Because... Uh, I've heard some of the experiences that they've had in World War II, the 27th Division, on Saipan, for instance. I got a writing home that a man wrote, mm -hmm. one, a brother, one of the guys I was in service with, told about what happened to him, and you'd have to read this thing to believe it. He got shot up so yeah. bad. So, and the guys thought that they might be going to Korea? Uh, I don't know whether they did or not. Uh -huh. did, did your drill? Activities change any because no, not very much. You know, we drilled uh, we drilled one night a week, mm -hmm. and and uh, two weeks in the summer. That's all. Tell me about yeah. uh, what was a typical drill night like. Uh, well, a typical drill night for me was different once I got into battalion staff. Yeah. But a typical drill night would be a uh, uh, certain amount of close order drill, calisthenics, uh, maybe a class in map reading or. Uh, uh, Depending what 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 your uh, MOS, what section you were assigned to, maybe motor maintenance down in the basement. This was in the Washington Avenue Army in Schenectady where we met. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, your annual training was at Fort Drum. Fort Fort Drum. Yeah. Okay. How did you How did you get there? Well, did we drove up. Drove up? Yeah. The vehicles? Yeah. Uh, well, no, wait a minute. No, we went, how did we get there? I was up there four times, 
My wife used to come up and bring the car. No, we went up by convoy. Yeah, and, and uh, my wife used to come up and visit because on the weekend in between the two weeks, I remember we went up to the Thousand Islands, you know, things like that. <coughs> so what was annual training like? What did you do? Well, we had field exercises. I remember Chauncey Cole. He was our opera er, operations, he was a major, uh, operations uh, S4. And boy, I'll tell you, you run the field with him. We, we'd go out on these, uh, uh, a lot of a lot of hiking, a lot of uh, uh, well, simulated battles. But uh, the only the, the the privates, the lower class people, didn't get so much out of it as the it was more training for the officers. You see, the officers could comprehend or understand what was going on. I think that they got more out of the infantry. A lot of them had no idea what it was all about, you know, the private, and because they'd go where they were told and do what they were told to do, and that was about it. But uh, a lot of it, uh, uh, you, you had to uh, know some map reading, and that is if you were in charge of a, a, a squad or a platoon, or, uh, and you had to go to a certain place and be by a certain route, you had to understand some map reading. And that's one place where I fit in pretty good because I was pretty pretty much having worked with Charlie Clayton going across Europe. I remember those maps we had over there were, uh, you know, not always the greatest either. But but we if we if we couldn't read a map, we, we were in tough shape. Did you live in barracks or did you live in tents? When? In, in annual training. Oh, and we lived in, in barracks. In barracks except out in the field. We'd go out in the field sometimes and stay overnight. Yeah. Would it be overnight, several nights? Uh, two or three nights sometimes in a row, yeah. yeah. And uh, what kind of equipment were you using? Basically the same equipment as World War II? No, because in World War II, my sidearm as a tanker was the old grease gun, the old 45 caliber grease gun. Yeah. My, my sidearm in the, in, the, in the National Guard was a carbine. And, uh, uh, and of course, some of them had M M1s. But basically the unit was wearing World War II era. Oh, yeah, arms. yeah, yeah, the old Eisenhower jacket, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did there seem to be any kind of uh, camaraderie among the troops? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. I still remember when I see, if I see some of the guys who were in the National Guard, uh, one man named Ed Burmass, who was our county legislature here for a while, he was in the National Guard there with me. Uh, I can remember quite a few of the people that were, one man uh, you've probably heard a lot about, uh, he's not in too much good repute. He ran the OTB, uh, uh, Davis Atkin. Yeah, he was he was in our company in the National Guard. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, I thought Davis was, he was a lawyer. Uh, I always thought a lot of him. Of course, he got in a lot of trouble with his OTB. But, but then again, he built OTB. But uh, a lot of people, I thought, I, I, I enjoyed the National Guard. We used to have, a, you know, every once in a while, we'd have a outing someplace, you know, go out for a, uh, company party or something, and I thought we had pretty good esprit de corps. Yes. It wasn't bad anyway. Yeah. How was it as a military unit? Kind of hard to say because you know we were never really put to a real, real test. Uh, I think had they been called up, they would have, they would have definitely have had to have some real intensive training before they would want to go. I don't think. They weren't combat ready, that's for sure. You know, that's, uh, they certainly had to have good leadership. Uh, and then again, of course, at that time, quite a few of the officers were uh, uh, World War II veterans. Chauncey Cole had been with the 27th Division. I'm trying to think who was oh, the colonel. He was company commander in H Company, uh, Cook. Cook. Anyway, he, he became a colonel. Uh, I can't even think of his name. I knew him well. Uh, sometimes those names slip you. But uh, I, they, they would have definitely needed, I would say, uh, three, four, or five, six months good intensive training to really go into combat. It isn't, you know, when I went to the Army in 42, I went down to go in the Army, and a, my brother-in-law's brother named Bobby Lawn went down the same day I did. Only I went in the Army, and he went in the Marines. I was just really getting into basic training in Camp Campbell, Kentucky, and he was on Guadalcanal with the Marines. You know, they give what they give him a rifle and tell him how to put the bullets in or something and send him over there. I guess you know. Five weeks he was on Guadalcanal. Uh, do you remember being called up for any emergencies or 
No, no, I don't. No, we never were. Not to my knowledge. Not while I was in it. That was three years and nine months. And where was the order? At Washington Avenue, Schenectady. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's not the armory there now, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe it's still there now. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Anything else in particular you remember about the unit during those four years? Just that I felt, I felt that there was some politics going on between regimental headquarters and, yeah. and over there. I felt like that uh, they were trying to search. Uh, that's the impression I got. I think I got right in the middle of it. Yeah. You know. What is the nature of the politics? Of the well, I think that they were trying to uh, induce our battalion commander in Schenectady to resign, retire. And who was the battalion commander in Schenectady? Uh, Frigoletto was his last name. And I don't who, remember. Who the regimental commander was? Uh, Baker. John Baker? I think so, yeah. I think it was Baker. And O'Toole was the plans and training officer of her regiment. Uh, I think it was O'Toole. Chauncey Cole was our, our uh, uh, S4 over there. And I don't even... At that time, they were starting to bring in a lot of new second lieutenant. I mean, young, young, real young second lieutenant. See, I was 28, and uh, Asian grade was 28 for infantry, for, for a commission. So that really what uh, lost me up. My, I got my endorsements all the way from the commanding general right on down, and uh, uh, I thought I had it made. And, and, but then I would have had to really do something really spectacular to make first lieutenant within a very short period of time, I suppose, to be in. So, May, um, I should, if I'd have just stayed as a master sergeant, I probably would have stayed here for my 20 years, you know, or whatever. Maybe even longer than that, who knows. Because I got some good friends of mine that stayed in the service here after we got out. And, well, in fact, I got to go visit one of them pretty soon. He just went in a nursing home. Anything else you remember about the 105th from those days? 105th? No, I used to, I used to, we used to play basketball <laughs> with them. We used to go play Amsterdam and, and Schenectady and, you know, bounce around the basketball team. And uh, it, was, it was a good, good outfit. It was uh, uh, typical American boys, I guess you might say. I think, though, at that time, it was during the Korean War. And uh, a lot, uh, may, we, I used to go out, in fact, as we had a campaign, and I went out with one of the younger people visiting uh, high school students in their homes, you know, mm -hmm. and trying to induce them to join the National Guard. And uh, uh, I don't know if I ever really got anybody to join, but a lot of, I got a lot of them thinking about it. And if their parents, you know, this would be in the presence of their parents, saying you can, you can, you can fulfill your, your uh, military obligation by serving in the National Guard. And uh, I enjoyed doing that. And, uh, and of course, it, it made it some kind of an impression, the fact that I was a master sergeant and I had a few combat ribbons and, and things like that. And uh, uh, so. Uh, good. I think that's a good point for us to conclude on. Yeah.